So good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Banking and Finance Academy session on the anatomy of a real estate finance deal. My name's Lindsay Lee. I'm a senior associate in the Banking and Financial Services team here at Brodie's, and I'm joined today by three of my colleagues from the Brodie's banking team, Jamie Steele, Ben O'Doherty, and Milo Bowne. And they're going to talk us through three different aspects of a real estate finance deal with special focus on real estate development finance. So moving on to what we're actually going to cover, in today's Banking and Finance Academy, Jamie is going to take a look at how real estate finance transactions are typically structured, the key participants and their commercial concerns. Ben's then going to run us through the security documents that we typically see in retail, uh, real estate finance transactions. And finally, Milo is going to walk us through key conditions precedent and how to efficiently manage the CP checklist from inception to completion. We're aiming to deliver, to deliver this session in about 35 minutes and we'll do our best to stick to that. So with that, I think we'll just jump straight in and I'll hand over to Jamie. Great, thanks, Lindsay. As a general introduction, real estate finance is a means of putting funding in place for the purchase, development and or operation of commercial or residential property. The ambit of real estate finance is wide. It covers a variety of property types and um, which are shown on the slide and includes things such as offices, shopping centres, retail and leisure, hotels, student accommodation, social housing, amongst others. There are different factors which will have relevance depending on the specifics of each transaction, but it's helpful to gain familiarity with how real estate transactions are typically structured when embarking on a real estate finance deal. So before we look at the structure of a real estate finance deal, it's important to highlight that real estate finance transactions are generally investment or development in nature. A development property transaction relates to the purchase or refinance of a property which is either completely unbuilt or is to be refurbished or redeveloped, whereas an investment property transaction generally relates to the acquisition or refinancing of a property which is already built and operational. So once a property is developed, it can then be it can then be sold or the income stream from operating the property used to generate income. Properties may also have existing tenants in situ, but this would be more likely on an on an investment deal, such as where the property is a shopping centre or office block, and rental income from tenants can be used to service the loan, and depending on the financing terms, towards repayment of equity and or subordinated debt. So for the purposes of this training session, we'll be focusing on a real estate development finance structure, which looks something like this. And we'll break this down and we'll focus on the key parties as we go through. So first of all, in a typical real estate development financing facility, as illustrated in the diagram, the borrower is often a special purpose vehicle or also known as an SPV. The SPV does not hold any assets other than those which relate to the property, including title to the property. Over the years, um, we have seen a trend towards using these kind of clean off the shelf SPVs and real estate finance deals, and there are advantages to be had from this. So first of all, from the borrower's perspective, borrowing via an SPV will ensure that the lender has limited recourse to its assets on enforcement. And this is important to a situation where the borrower Sorry, this is in comparison to a situation where the borrower is not an SPV and has interests in a number of other assets which do not relate to the property being financed or secured. Another advantage, but this time from a lender's perspective, is that using an SPV borrower gives the lender clarity about the financial viability of the transaction. The SPV is a new business with no financial baggage, no financial history, no debts or liabilities, and no outstanding legal cases. So immediately it represents a more attractive proposition to a lender. It's also worth noting that in an enforcement scenario, having an SPV borrower makes it much more straightforward to step in and take over the operation of the property or if desired to transfer the company or property. So as I just mentioned, if the borrower is an SPV and it has few or no assets of its own other than the undeveloped site, and its rights under the development documents, the lender will often require additional credit support. And now this may be in the form of third-party security or guarantees, 
from other group members, including any parent which is typically a holding company or sponsor. And it's worth just noting that the benefit of a holding company being the parent of the SBB is that if the lender were to require share, secu share security, it's much more straightforward to take the security over the shares in the borrower rather than having multiple individual shareholders. And from a legal perspective, this only increases the number of documents required and expense involved. So the lender is unlikely to provide all the money needed to buy the site and develop the property. Typically, the borrower will need to obtain the balance by way of subordinated loan or equity from equity investors or subordinated creditors. Now, these could be, for example, a director of the borrower or another group company hoping to share in the uplift from the property development. And these funds are then downstream to the borrower. Sometimes the lender will require the borrower to have received these additional funds before first drop down, drawdown, but in others, the lender, lender will permit them to be funded side by side with the advances it makes. If funds are provided by way of debt, this additional finance will be contractually and or structurally subordinated to the debt of the lender, usually by way of an intercreditor agreement or other ranking document. So in terms of the other key parties in a development transaction, the borrower will also need to obtain a team of advisors and professional consultants to assist it with certain aspects of the property development. The borrower will, will therefore appoint a development team, and this will generally consist of, uh, first of all, the contractors. So the contractor or builder is the party principally responsible for building the property. Now, when we talk about building, this might also include, among other things, demolition and remediation work on the site. So the contractor will enter into a building contract with the borrower, and this will set out the nature and extent of the building contractor's role, and it will also set out the requirements for the particular works. For example, the contractor may agree to implement the design produced by the developer or its professional team, or the contractor may take on elements of the design work itself which is also known as design and build. So we tend to see typically on large scale um, commercial developments that the contractor uses subcontractors to perform some or all of the works. Again, from a lender's perspective, the lender does have a degree of control over the choice of the building contractor and will typically have certain requirements regarding the, tech, the contractor's technical ability and relevant experience, as well as its financial standing. And that brings us on to subcontractors. So the contractor will often enter into subcontracts with subcontractors, and they each take responsibility for a specific aspect of the construction, and in some cases design. So subcontractors may be used to carry out specialist works that the main contractor does not have the expertise to complete, or it may simply need additional personnel. For example, subcontracted work can include groundworks, demolition, concrete, steel work, cladding, and so on. And the contractor will typically employ the subcontractors directly, and the contractor will assume the risk that the subcontractor will provide the works in accordance with the main building contract. And Ben will shortly discuss how security is taken over all of these development documents that sit within the structure. So now just looking at the professional consultants. So the professional consultants usually include those with responsibility for design, supervision, or project management, such as the architect, structural engineer, mechanical and electrical consultant, project manager, manager, and quantity surveyor, again, amongst others. It's important just to highlight that the architect is likely to be the key professional with overall design responsibility. And for that reason, we also see the architect assuming a coordinating or project management role. So the professional consultants, as you can see in the structure, are often employed or appointed directly by the borrower under individual appointment agreements and are not a party to the building contract. In some instances, the borrower's rights and obligations may subsequently be innovated to the contractor or the contractor may employ the relevant professional. And just again, from a lender's perspective in relation to the professional consultants, as with the key contractors and subcontractors, a lender will want to ensure that the professional consultants' appointments require each professional to act with an appropriate level of skill and care when performing the services 
and also that there is adequate resource to the relevant professional, whether directly or indirectly, in case problems arise. Ben will touch on this shortly, but it's important to note that the lender will usually request collateral warranties or some third party or assume third party rights in respect of the key professional consultants as part of its security package. The precise allocation of risk and responsibility between contractors and the professional consultants will always depend on how the development documents, including construction contracts, have been structured. And finally, the project monitor. The project monitor is the lender's independent representative, and they typically sign off or certify aspects of the development that require the lender's involvement. For example, drawdown requests to meet development costs or reallocations within the budget. The project monitor may also advise on the initial development appraisal, development budget or works program, an ongoing risk, potential or emerging is issues and material changes associated with the development. This allows the lender to make informed decisions, reduce the manager's exposure to risk and, pr and protect its financial interest. Project monitors tend to be either project managers or quantity surveyors, as these two professionals will have good knowledge of both the contractual and construction processes. I'll now hand over to Ben, who is going to discuss the security package of real estate finance transactions. Thanks very much, Jamie. So as Jamie said just now, I'm going to be talking to you about the security package that you typically encounter on a development finance deal. Due to time constraints today, this won't be an exhaustive list of every possible type of security or an in-depth look at specific legal drafting issues. Rather, what I do hope to do is pick out some of the key features of the security package to illustrate the commercial and legal considerations relevant to the borrower and lender. Now, before going on to discuss these key features, it might be worth saying just a few words on what taking security actually means for the benefit of any non-lawyers or non-finance lawyers watching. When a borrower grants security over an asset to a lender, it's an agreement under which the asset in question can be appropriated by the lender to satisfy the debt if the borrower defaults on the loan. Security documents typically give the lender a degree of control over the asset in question, principally by preventing the borrower from selling or otherwise disposing of the asset without the lender's consent. Crucially, in an insolvency situation, the lender will rank ahead of other creditors in respect of the proceeds of the sale of the secured asset. Security can be taken over all types of asset and asset classes, whether tangible, such as a plot of land in the real estate context, of course, or intangible, such as the rights under a contract. But the nature of the security will vary depending on the type of asset in question. And the final distinction to draw out here is between fixed and floating security. So fixed security, as the name suggests, attaches to a specific identifiable asset, such as a plot of land, my favorite example, um, or floating securities, on the other hand, hover or float above an asset or a pool of assets before becoming fixed upon the occurrence of certain events. This is something that we'll discuss a little bit later in relation to floating charges. So with that preliminary overview of taking security out of the way, we can, we can dive into the security package itself. So I think an instructive starting point and the starting point for the lenders council in any finance transaction is to ask where does the value in the borrower group lie and conversely where does the risk to the lender lie so with that in mind i think the logical starting point is to first consider the property itself of course that is the land on which the development is going to be built and as any Scottish real estate or banking lawyer will tell you, the only way to competently take fixed security over heritable property in Scotland is by way of a standard security. Now, this is one point, one of several points of difference between Scots and English law, as the English equivalent would be a legal mortgage. Standard securities are a creature of statute, having been introduced by the Convincing and Freedom Reform Scotland Act in 1970. And the 1970 Act sets out the prescribed form of a standard security and certain standard conditions which are automatically incorporated by statute. These conditions include, for example, that the borrower must insure the property to its market value and that the borrower cannot lease or alter the subjects without the lender's consent. Most of these conditions can, however, be varied. So in the development finance context, the Borrowers Council will be looking to ensure that, firstly, the terms of the standard security allow the development to be carried out, of course. Secondly, that the obligations regarding insurance are appropriate. And thirdly, that its terms don't otherwise cut across the broader commercial agreement with the lender or the terms of the loan agreement, facility agreement. 
so the standard security is the first piece of the package. However, in a development finance deal, the land in question will initially just be an empty field or, or a derelict, derelict, uh, derelict building. Pardon me. The value of that site will therefore be limited in relation to the cost of the development that the lender has agreed to fund. And successful repayment of the loan is therefore dependent on the future value of the developed site and the income stream it will generate. Consequently, the lender is exposed to quite a high level of risk during the development phase, and they will understandably want to ensure that they have a degree of control over the development documents, which Jamie mentioned earlier, which govern and regulate how the development proceeds. Uh, Jamie already alluded to some of these, but just as a quick summary, development documents are likely to include, am among other things, a main build contract with the principal contractor, collateral warranties with the various uh, specialist subcontractors and the appointments of the professional design team or uh, yeah, professional consultant design team like architects and so on. So how does a lender competently take security over these development documents? Well, in Scotland, a fixed security over contractual rights is taken by way of a document called an assignation in security. And an assignation security is an agreement whereby the assignor, that is, let's say the borrower, transfers its rights under a contract to an assignee, in this case, the lender, with the proviso that once the underlying debt is repaid, the assignee will discharge or retrocess, to use the lawyerly technical word, will retrocess the assignation such that the rights transfer back to the assignor. While the assignation is in place, the assignee has contractually replaced the assigner and enjoys all the rights and remedies under the assigned contract, including, for example, the right to compel performance of the counterparty's obligations. However, as in this case, where the assigned contract relates to an ongoing development, the efficacy of assignations and security gets slightly murky due to the formalities of Scots law in this area. So in order to be effective, an assignation must firstly be absolute, meaning the assigner retains no interest in the contract whatsoever. And secondly, it must also be intimated by way of notice to the contract counterparty. However, the assignation will often include provisions which provide that until an event of default occurs, the assigner will continue to administer and perform the contract on a day-to-day -day basis. There are therefore question marks from a legal perspective as to whether the contract has been truly assigned. And the effect of this may be to render the assignation incomplete. If there's an event of default and the lender does want to assume full control of the contract, the assignation will arguably need to be re-intimated and re-registered. Prior to this point, the lender is therefore at risk of an intervening insolvency event or an assignation to a third party acting in good faith, both of which would block the lender's security from being created. For these reasons, the lender may prefer, in the first instance, to seek to take a suite of its own collateral warranties from the principal contractor, the design team, and any key subcontractors with, respons with responsibility pardon me, for high value works packages. Now, before any banking law purists such as Jack Moyer, one of the partners in our team, start uh, shouting at the screen, I should point out that collateral warranties aren't, strictly speaking, security documents, as there is no underlying asset being secured. Rather, they are direct agreements between the lender and the development counterparty, which create a direct contractual relationship. Collateral warranties thereby give the lender the benefit of direct obligations and undertakings, such as, for example, that the counterparty will carry out its responsibilities with reasonable skill and care. In addition, collateral warranties also usually provide for step-in rights, which allow the lender, as the name suggests, to step into the borrower's shoes and finish the development if the borrower becomes insolvent or otherwise breaches the terms of the loan. Similarly, on the converse side, the development counterparty will usually be precluded from terminating its underlying contract with the borrower without first giving notice to the lender and allowing the lender the opportunity to remedy the issue or step in. It is worth saying briefly, though, that exercising step-in rights is very much a last resort for a lender as obviously they're in the business of lending money rather than developing property. So from a commercial and legal perspective, they don't really want to assume control of a development if they can possibly avoid it. So thus far, our security package, which is being brought to life in vivid technicolor on the slide here, uh, our security package has captured the land itself and the development which is to be constructed on that land. So returning to the framing question at the top of the slide there, where else does the value in the structure lie? Well, Jamie highlighted the fact that the borrower will usually be an SPV, which holds no other assets at the time of funding other than the, the site itself. However, as the development proceeds, the borrower may ingather resources and thereby acquire various other movable assets. It's therefore standard for the lender to take a floating charge over all of the assets of the borrower. 
a floating charge creates a security which floats over a company's assets, usually over all of a company's assets. But the company retains the ability to buy, sell, and otherwise deal with those assets in the ordinary course of business without the lender's consent. In Scotland, a floating charge attaches to the assets over which it floats, a process known as crystallization, upon the occurrence of uh, pardon me, upon the occurrence of certain events, such as firstly, when the company goes into li liquidation, or when the holder of the floating charge appoints a receiver, or on the occurrence of certain events following the appointment of an administrator. In each case, the, the attachment has the effect as if the floating charge were a fixed security over the property to which it has attached. If there's an event of default, the lender can normally proceed to appoint administrators under the floating charge and, in certain limited circumstances, may be able to appoint receivers. Both such appoint appointments can be made relatively quickly, allowing the lender to appoint an insolvency practitioner to take control of the company's assets. This makes the floating charge a key part of a lender's security package. Another form of security which gives the lender a degree of optionality and enforcement is a security granted by the parent over the shares in the borrower itself. In Scotland, fixed security, fixed share security, pardon me, is taken in the form of a document called a share pledge. Now, unfortunately, we don't have time today to get into some of the uh, fascinating legal technical issues around Scottish share pledges. Um, but it should be noted that perfection of a share pledge requires the shares to be legally transferred to the lender and for the lender to be recorded as the shareholder in the company's register of members. There are various risks associated with this approach from the lender's perspective, which, as I've said, we don't have time to fully explore today. For present purposes, the key point is that a share pledge gives the lender the option of taking control of and selling the borrower itself rather than taking control of the land and or procuring the development uh, procuring the, the finalization of the development. And that there are certain advantages to this approach, including avoidance of LBTT, for example, which make it an attractive option for lenders. So from the lender's perspective, I think the security is now looking pretty good, I would say. We've got the land, we've got the development documents, we've got a floating charge over the assets of the borrower and a, char a fixed security over the, the shares in the borrower itself. So if you're a property developer, if you're a borrower, you might be forgiven for thinking, what more could the lender ask for? Well, from the lender's perspective, we can return again to the framing question at the top of the slide there and ask, where does the risk lie? We've mentioned that during the development phase, the borrower won't have a significant income stream or potentially any income stream. However, during this period, the lender will still be charging periodic interest payments on the loan. How then will the borrower afford to make these payments? Similarly, if for unforeseen circumstances, development costs exceed the amount of the loan advanced to fund those costs, who would pay for that overrun? Well, as Jamie alluded to earlier, lenders will often seek to mitigate such risks by obtaining guarantees from the borrower's parent company or another third party sponsor. The document under which these particular guarantees are made is called, unsurprisingly, an interest and cost overrun guarantee. Again, a guarantee isn't strictly speaking a security document as there is no underlying asset as such. It's rather a contractual promise, if you like, between the given by the parent on, on behalf of a third party in respect of the obligations of the borrower. Um, in this instance, in respect of the borrower's interest payments over a given period and any potential cost overruns at the development. So that completes my uh, whistle stop tour of a development finance security package. And I'll now hand over to my colleague Milo, who's going to talk to you about the CP checklist and how this can be effectively managed. Thanks, Ben. As Ben just mentioned, today I'm gonna to talk us through conditions president, what they are, why they're important and what they generally cover or include in a development finance transaction. So what are conditions precedent? In the context of any facility agreement, conditions precedent, or commonly known as CPs, are conditions which must be satisfied before a borrower can utilise and draw a loan. In most deals, and certainly where the CPs are fairly extensive, the CPs are set out as a schedule to the facility agreement, and from that they're transposed into the CP checklist. The CP checklist is a live document which is used to monitor the progress of the deal highlighting key areas that need to be progressed before completion can occur. Usually it is the lender's lawyers who prepare the CP checklist and as and when the borrower or their advisors produce the CP documents, the checklist is updated and recirculated to the parties. And this way all parties can see the status of each CP and it means that the lender's lawyers can collect, review and approve the CP documents as they come in. As a trainee within the banking team, one of my main roles in any loan transaction is centred around actively managing the CPs within the deal, 
ensuring that the checklist is closely monitored and updated whilst also attending regular conference calls where parties from all, where all lawyers from all parties discuss the progress of the CPs. So the CPs are included in the facility agreement to benefit the lender, providing them with information about the borrower and the transaction so that it can be satisfied on the key issues that they've based their credit appraisal on before releasing funds to the borrower. In a real estate development finance deal, the lender will advance the loan facilities to the borrower to both purchase and develop the property. The lender therefore needs to be provided with key information about the property which has been purchased and also about the development which is then taking place. As a result, a standard development finance deal will have multiple drawdowns with CPs that need to be satisfied at the first drawdown and then at subsequent periodic drawdowns. The CPs can be split into two categories, documentary and factual CPs, and I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about each of these. So looking first at documentary CPs. CPs are deal specific and they vary depending on the type of loan transaction and on the purpose of the loan. In a general loan transaction, there are standard documentary CPs that you would expect to see in a schedule to the facility agreement, such as the signed facility agreement, the signed finance documents, such as security docs, guarantees, intercreditor agreements, and where the borrower, guarantor or obliger is a company, director certificates from each company containing certified constitutional documents with board minutes and shareholder resolutions approving the terms of the transaction and the entry into the loan and the security documents. Looking more specifically at a real estate development facility loan, the CPs will normally be split into two categories, those required at the initial drawdown and then those required at subsequent periodic drawdowns. So looking first at CPs at the initial drawdown, the lender will require most of the CPs to be satisfied before the first drawdown. These often include valuation and surveys, so the lender will often require the borrower to obtain a formal valuation of the property based on the market value. There are also many other reports and certificates that are commonly required by the lender, such as environmental, coal and archaeological reports, as well as energy performance certificates. Moving now to insurance, the borrower's insurance broker will often be required to provide a letter detailing the insurance policies required by the lender. It is important here that this letter outlines the required information to satisfy the lender's requirements. In a real estate development finance deal, the lender will also require there to be professional indemnity insurance for each of the development contractors, subcontractors and consultants. Dialogue with the broker should be opened as early as possible in the process as it can become a source of delay and frustration as the transaction proceeds. The broker's letter requires to be negotiated as the broker often doesn't receive a fee for providing the letter and it can be a potential source of liability. Further, the broker's letter is usually subject to amendment so that the broker can provide the confirmation that meets the requirements stated in the facility agreement. However, the broker is often hesitant to provide a view on whether the insurance meets the requirements of the facility due to the differing language used in the insurance policy and the finance documentation. As a result of this, the broker often limits their confirmation to a point of time or to factual confirmation. There will also be various CPs relating to the title to the property has been financed, such as certificates of, certificates of title, reports on title, lease documents, various searches at the land register, discharges of existing securities, and any evidence that's required by the lender showing that the property has been transferred to the borrower. Moving now to the development documentation required, as both Jamie and Ben have touched upon, collateral warranties will be provided by key members of the development team, such as the building contractor, subcontractors, and professional consultants involved in the development. Other development documents include planning permission for the property development and the project monitors report. Furthermore, the duty of care agreement entered into by the asset manager, borrower and the lender, as well as the contract relating to the appointment of the asset manager of the property, will need to be provided to the lender. And finally, the borrower will, be, borrower will be required to show evidence of their VAT registration and the exercise of the option to tax if required. An option to tax allows a business to charge VAT on the sale or rental of non-residential property. So for the subsequent drawdowns that may be required to cover certain development costs, there will be CPs that need to be satisfied. These often include, firstly, the lender may require the contractors or consultants involved in the development to certify that the payment requested to be drawn down is justified and has not already been provided. Secondly, invoices and other evidence relating to the development costs may be required by the lender or project monitor to justify the funds being drawn down. 
The project monitor may also be required to certify various things, such as consents have been obtained, any payments aren't overdue, the works completed on the development comply with the development documents, and the obligations imposed under the facility agreement are being complied with by the borrower. There may also be additional security or development documents that may need to be provided. And finally, the lender may require sight of the applicable insurance policy. Turning now to the factual CPs, these are also found in the facility and confirmed by the borrower in the utilisation request. The factual CPs will confirm that no event of default or potential event of default exists or arises from the loan being made to the borrower, the warranties and representations in the facility agreement are true, and that there's no material adverse change to the borrower, guarantor or obliger's financial position. For development facilities, the factual CPs will also require the borrower to confirm specific financial covenants relating to the loan-to-value ratio and loan-to-cost ratio. So moving now to drawing down the loan is actually tied to the CPs being satisfied in full. So in a standard loan, the documentary CPs must be satisfied to allow the borrower to issue the utilisation request, and the factual CPs must be met on the date of the utilisation request and drawdown. However, in a real estate development deal, the borrower can issue the utilisation request prior to the documentary CPs being fulfilled. This allows the first drawdown to be made under the facility so that the borrower can use the funds to purchase the property. This is necessary as many of the documentary CPs can only be produced by the borrower once they've purchased the property. So after the initial drawdown, the borrower will, will then make periodic drawdowns during the term of the facility to cover the development costs of the project. For any subsequent drawdowns, the borrower will be required to satisfy any necessary CPs as I've already just discussed, and then produce a utilisation request to the lender outlining the amount to be drawn and its purpose. So turning now from conditions precedent to conditions subsequent. Conditions subsequent are conditions that don't need to be satisfied for completion, but do need to be satisfied within a particular time frame after completion has taken place. Conditions subsequent are normally either the production of documents, which can't be produced until after financial close, meaning when the loan funds have been drawn down, or CPs which the lender has agreed to change to a condition, condition subsequent to prevent any delays to completion. As with CPs, conditions subsequent are usually set out in a schedule to the facility agreement. If the condition subsequent is not provided for within the time frame agreed between the borrower and the lender, this is likely to trigger an event of default under the facility agreement where the lender can terminate the facility and demand immediate payment from the borrower. So that brings us to the end of Jamie, Ben and I's presentation on a real estate development finance deal. And I will now hand back over to Lindsay who will wrap up today's discussion. Thank you, Milo. So yeah, that brings the presentation part of today's session to an end, but we do have a couple of minutes or so just to get some further thoughts on particular aspects of these types of deal. Um, Jamie, if we could come back to you, you highlighted the various parties that are involved in a development finance transaction, and both you and Ben touched on the fact that once the development phase has completed, the next stages for the property to, in theory, or hopefully become income generating. So at that stage, what other parties get involved? Yes, so obviously, so once the development has been completed and, you know, the contractors and professional consultants um, have fallen away, um, at that point, the property would tend to be sort of let out to multiple tenants. Um, and the borrower at that stage would then, or at least we would normally see them appoint a managing agent. So I guess the role of the managing agent is to collect and administer the rent, um, and service charge and generally deal with managing the property. Um, and this appointment is generally dealt with under a management agreement. Um, I think something also to highlight is that, that the lender would, would generally also want to review the, the management agreement just to ensure that the managing agent's obligations, I guess in particular in relation to rent collection, are adequate. Um, and that also that the managing agent is required to have suitable professional indemnity insurance um, and again, so the lender will also usually require this managing agent to enter into a duty of care agreement. And that duty of care would also create a direct contractual link between the lender and the managing agent. Um, for example, if the managing agent performs the obligation under the management agreement badly or not at all, then the and the lender might suffer a loss. Um, the lender would obviously look to have recourse um, to the managing agent. And um, so in terms of the parties there, yes, we've been looking at the contractors and professionals 
falling away and, and as I say, a managing agent stepping in place. Okay, thanks, Jamie. So just ending on a kind of, you know, taking a step back, a wider and a, a hotter, hot <clears> topic. <throat> ben, I'm thinking of ESG. Um, what sort of impact are we seeing ESG factors having on real estate finance deals? Sure. Well, like you said, it, it is a hot topic, but I think the message here needs to be that it, it's it's here to stay. Um, just in general terms across the sector, we are seeing a lot of the finance sector in general, not just real estate. That we are seeing a huge amount of investment from lenders in their ESG uh, lending teams. And for clearing banks, for example, ESG factors are now part of the, the credit approval process. Um, and similarly for, for private investors, they need to consider uh, ESG factors to comply with certain disclosure requirements incumbent upon them under, under policy and regulation. And then in terms of specifically to the real estate finance sector, there is there is a, a policy uh, shift, I suppose, a policy movement towards ever, ever greener investment. And just as one example of that, um, two of the partners in our team, Mark Meeklejohn and Chris Dunn, are specialists in social social housing finance, and the ESG uh, agenda, if you want to call it that, um, manifests itself there in that if borrowers comply with certain um, ESG indicators or benchmarks, they sometimes qualify for an improved um, an improved margin, so they pay less interest effectively, so they they get cheaper money. Um, Although in recent years, Mark was telling me the other day that it has shifted from more of a more of a from a carrot to a stick, in that the um, the approach now is that if the borrower fails to achieve certain ESG benchmarks or indicators, they then pay more interest, so that the margin increases uh, slightly. So that's just a couple of examples of how we're how we're seeing it in the real estate finance sector. Great, thank you, Ben. That I think brings today's. Uh session to a close. Thank you once again to everyone for joining us. Uh, on that note, thank you and goodbye.